So we have an exciting panel for you today. I'm, let me just introduce our panel chair and then let him take over from here. And I think we're talking about somebody who does not need much of an introduction because he's been in the sector and in the higher education system for some 35 years. Uh, Dr. Chris Whitaker, who we're very proud to have as an alumni of our program. Um, but of course, his, he, uh, his, his major accomplishments, I think, are in his roles as president and CEO of Humber College and of course of St. Lawrence. So Chris, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Glenn. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, it's really great to be back here, and uh, I've I've gotten to see some familiar faces, faces I haven't seen since uh, pre-COVID. Maybe some going back to my time in the cohort. Uh, I graduated in 2011, uh, my second stab at a PhD. So uh, uh, I was uh, lucky enough to be successful in graduating. But uh, I wanted to first uh, thank you for the invitation to be here today. I'm looking forward to uh, moderating this keynote panel. Uh, I want to thank Glenn for the introduction, thank the organizers, and uh, and thank the deputy for those very comprehensive remarks. As you've heard, there's lots on the go in the college sector uh, right now, and there always will be lots on the go. The, the bedrock of Ontario, as I think the, the deputy called it. So, so today we are going to hear from uh, uh, four panelists who are going to be giving the, uh, the president's perspective on the college role building the Ontario of tomorrow. And my fun job, because I am recently retired from Humber, is uh, I get to moderate the panel and, and they get to do the real work. So uh, after the introductions, I'm going to call each of them up. Uh, uh, they're going to speak for about 10 minutes. We're going to open it up to the floor for Q&A, and that will take us to the lunch hour. So uh, so I hope you're prepared for a, uh, a lively session, and uh, hopefully you'll have a few questions for our panelists because they're, they're ready to take them. So first of all, in, in no particular order, um, I am just going to read the bios, and I have taken some liberties with some slight editing because not everybody met that 100-word uh, limit that we were asked for on the bio. These are college executives, you know. So, so first of all, uh, Maureen Adamson uh, from Fleming. Maureen Adamson was appointed as the sixth president of Fleming College, effective August uh, 20th, 2018. She has more than 25 years of progressive leadership experience in the post-secondary healthcare, government, and not-for-profit sectors. Prior to joining Fleming, Maureen was the deputy minister of tourism, culture, and sport, and the deputy minister of the status of women for the province of Ontario. She served as president and CEO for the Mitzner Institute for Applied Health Sciences, as CEO for Cystic Fibrosis Canada, and as vice president of corporate services at Mohawk College. Maureen holds a diploma in business administration from Fleming, which she's now returned to, amazing, a bachelor of business administration from Lakehead University, and an MBA from the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management. She's completed the director's education program at the Rotman School of Management and the Institute of Corporate Directors, and is a certified director with the Institute of Corporate Directors Canada. Does anybody need anybody on their board? Maureen is a PhD candidate currently working on her Doctor of Philosophy in Higher Education. So let's give her a round of applause. Next, we have Sean Kennedy, president of Niagara College since 2020. Sean joined the college in 20, uh, 2006 as vice president of student and external relations and CEO of the Niagara College Foundation, and later served as vice president academic and Senior Vice President International. Sean also held senior roles at Red Deer College and the University of Alberta. A leader in international education and student services, Sean has served on the Board of Directors of the Canadian Bureau for International Education, chaired the College of Ontario Student Access and Success uh, Coordinating Committee, and has served numerous various uh, community boards. Sean holds a Master of Public Administration and is completing doctoral studies at the University of Toronto. Let's welcome Sean. Okay, Beverly Roy, a PhD, ABD in higher education, is an Anishinaabeg way with over 10 years of experience in the indigenous post-secondary sector with Kenj, Kenjgawin Teg, sorry Beverly, but my pronunciation, Kenjgawin Teg is located on the Chijing First Nation Manitoulin Island in Northern Ontario and is one of nine indigenous institutes in Ontario recognized under the Indigenous Institutes Act of 2017. Beverly has held different roles within Kenj, Kenj Gawin Teg, 
currently the president was the uh, uh, interacting president. She was also the directory of Qual director of quality assurance, director of post-secondary education and training, gaining various experiences and perspectives on the challenges, advocacy, and approaches needed in advancing Indigenous Anishinaabek lifelong learning and Indigenous institutes as part of Ontario's higher education system. As an organizationally accredited place of learning by the Indigenous Advanced Education and Skills Council, Kenj Gawenteg is positioned to begin its development of Indigenous Anishinaabek worldview diplomas, certificates, and degrees. Please welcome Beverly. Okay, and finally, uh, as, as provost, Corey Ross is, uh, leads George Brown College's strategy in the areas of academic programming, international research, and work integrated learning. Corey has held progressive leadership positions since joining George Brown College in 2007, including interim executive dean and dean of the School of Community Services and Early Childhood and the School of Health Sciences and vice president academic. Prior to joining George Brown, Corey was Vice President Academic and Executive Director of Institutional Development at the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine from 1994 to 2003. He was the Manager of Organizational Health at Mount Sinai Hospital from 2004 to 2007, and he was the President and CEO of a biotech research firm from 1989 to 2004. Corey earned a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and Master of Science in Anatomy at the University of Manitoba, a Doctor of Chiropractic from the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College, a Diploma in Strategic Management from Oxford University, and a Master of Business Administration and Healthcare Management from Queen Margaret University in Scotland. He is a certified health executive. Uh, Corey was elected to the Fellowship of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh uh, in the spring of 2019. And I did shorten Corey's bio a little bit more. But so please welcome Corey. So, so as you can see, we have a wealth of experience and perspective uh, up here on the panel. And uh, I look forward to hearing the presentations. And with that, I will turn it over to Maureen Adamson. Maureen. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. And again, a big thanks to uh, Lisa for pulling this event together. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, you know, we've all, we all know about the origin of colleges. We all know about its response to the second uh, industrial revolution and all of that massive uh, demand for uh, educational services. But I'm really interested to talk a little bit about what, where we are today. And, you know, we all know about the things that are, you know, tuition freeze, international students, we can talk about it forever. But what can we really do, uh, having just had our conversation as a, a group of presidents with the Blue Ribbon panel, to really think about this as an opportunity to reshape uh, the college sector? And I do call it a sector because I think we're a long way from being a system. So I, I just want to talk a little bit about the change. We, things have changed a lot since uh, colleges were uh, established. And I had the privilege as a college president in my community to uh, facilitate a strategic planning session for the newly appointed mayor and his council. And one of the things that we started with, because I have a group of um, institutional researchers at Fleming and we gain uh, and, and mine a lot of business intelligence. And I can tell you, I pamper uh, the, and water and feed that group because they are invaluable to, to what we do. So to start with that strategic session with the mayor, we started with where are we really at today? So we looked at five cities, five cities like Peterborough, and we looked at cities that had comparable data. So similar uh, geographical landscape, similar demographic, uh, similar trajectory and growth, did they have a college uh, in the community? Did they have public services in the community? So we chose Peterborough, Guelph, Barry, Kingston, and Thunder Bay. And what was very interesting to really paint the landscape of where we are today is that when you looked at rental vacancy rates, they were an average of 1.8%, Peterborough being the lowest, but in all five communities, 1.8%, that's a challenge. In Peterborough, we have the highest opioid uh, rate of death 
in Ontario. And we are only second to all of the Northern communities, but followed by really important communities like all in Ontario, but London, Niagara, that's a problem. We looked at median wage. Average median wage in these communities was 64,000 to 82,000. Now that's a tough slog. I mean, it can be done, but here's the sad news in all of it. When you looked at the jobs that were less than a living wage, 29 to 35% of all of those jobs paid a living wage that was less than uh, what is considered uh, appropriate. So for me and what I'm trying to do, and you know, with many failed attempts, I think there are three things that colleges need to think about. Three things that colleges need to uh, take on as roles. One, I think is to be a convener of disruptive discussion. And I'll talk more about each of these a little bit. Second, I think we need to be committed to city building in our regions. And when I say commit, I don't mean talk, I mean ante up some of our assets because in rural communities in particular, we have them. And third, I think we need to do a better job at influencing government. And I can tell you a little bit about how policies get done when I was a deputy and assistant deputy minister. So let me just start with convener of uh, disruptive discussion. So at Fleming in April, we held a symposium much like this, but uh, with a lot of leaders. So we brought in um, some keynote speakers like Mehed Ninshi from Calgary, who's rebuilt cities, Mary Rowe, the head of uh, urban planning for the Association for Canada. We brought in uh, Marie Wilson, the commissioner from Truth and Reconciliation. And we had all the leaders like the local hospital CEO, the local police chief, the local fire chief, all of the lawyers who dealt with criminal matters, and so on and so on. And we asked each of the panels and each of the participants to give us three ideas of how we could change things around. And we had two young women that um, uh, were MCs and you know, really getting people to think about it. And of course we were talking about housing, of course we were talking about economy and, and health, health uh, in our city, but it was framed in a way where we talked about caring city, participat participatory city, um, a healthy city, uh, a caring, and, and those kinds of words that really changed the conversation and shaped it differently so that people could really see themselves in it. And I can tell you that it was a buzz. We are, people are still talking about it. The mayor has brought lots of those panelists in to talk to them. And we are still getting, we had 47.5 million impressions in social media. And what was really interesting to me is half of them were from the United States because in the United States, a lot of the colleges are doing this, this very work that we just, we're just thinking about. And thank you for putting this up. The day was captured by an artist on a 10 by 15 um, whiteboard that tried to capture all of these ideas that will sit in the, in the uh, lobby of City Hall in Peterborough. But, and it was a fun way for people to really see and keep looking at those ideas. So thank you for putting that up. I know we weren't supposed to have slides. Um, committing to being a city builder. I have lived and worked in Toronto all of my adult life. And when I moved to Peterborough, I was just, I found it staggering the number of acres with asphalt on them, flat asphalt, sitting idle. Uh, at Fleming College, we have acres of land sitting idle in, in all of our campuses. In the Lindsay campus, where we have four campuses, we have 300 acres sitting empty. So I've struck a land development use committee, again, taking some of these folks from the Ignite Symposium to come and bring ideas. And can we rezone some of this land? Can we have some mixed use land? Can we talk about retirement homes? Can we talk about townhomes? How can we start to solve but still creating the campus of Fleming and making it vibrant, um, but really starting to think about how we can better use this land. In Halliburton, we have an art school. Um, I'll be very frank, we lose money. We lose a lot of money in Halliburton. But the reality is we can't 
gain money if we don't have a residence. So we, through the pandemic, when a lot of spending was coming to a halt, we continued to forge ahead and we're building a residence because all of the precarious workers that are needed in Halliburton have, have nowhere to stay. So it's a direct hit on their economy because students are taking up some of that space. So it's it's things like that that I think we can do. Now in that, that case of Halliburton, they don donated land to me. But in the case of the other campuses, and I think I'm, my board will be behind me, we can start to use land for our region. And I know my board would wanna be part of that. You know, it was very interesting to me uh, at this Ignite Summit, when Mary Rowe stood up and talked about how cities across Canada and frankly in rural United States are all in the same situations that many of our rural communities are, she showed a picture of an apple and it has stuck with me ever since because she talked about how the apple rots from the core out and how important it is for us to take care of our cities. And where we can, it's very different here in Toronto, I'm, I'm learning very quickly, but where we can put community services downtown, uh, down into our communities. And we've done that with a, a, a couple of programs, our uh, service management employment program, but it's tough, right? Because employees still have to walk through all kinds of stuff and needles and all the rest of it, but, but we have to start. And then lastly, I would say influencing government. I can tell you from being a deputy minister and an assistant deputy minister in health for eight years, government doesn't do operations. They're not experts. They look to people in this room to gain insights and knowledge to create policy. And to be very honest, policy doesn't just come off the desk of a bureaucrat. It is usually in response to some kind of an issue. I can tell you the hotel tax when I was deputy minister, it was because there were some bad operators out of Niagara and they were charging a hotel tax. So we had to create a regulation so that it was all across the province, um, things like that. And I would say also um, when, when it comes to the experts that we can be more proactive. At Fleming, we've just started a, an indigenous labor market platform. And this is a platform, it, we think it's the only one in Canada. We can't find it anywhere else where we're starting to match Indigenous employees to Indigenous employers and so on and so forth. And as a result, we got noticed. And HECO has asked us to do some work for them on transitioning international students uh, into the marketplace. So I, I think where I'm going with this, we as colleges and experts in this room need to be the go-to for, uh, for influencing policy. And if, if you don't believe me, um, I don't know who you listen to during COVID and all of those updates every day, but my go-to was Staney Brown because he was the guy with the data. He didn't have a political agenda and he told it to you straight without riddles or you know, uh, having to draw, uh, draw the party line. So I think there's some things we can do that are very different than just delivering programs, just talking about frozen tuition, just talking about international students because we can use that revenue to reinvest in our communities if we have those disruptive uh, discussions, if we really commit and ante up, and if we take a very aggressive role in influencing government policy. That's my thought. Thanks very much, Maureen. And now, Sean, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, Maureen, that's a tough act to follow. Maureen had notes. Uh, she noted that I, I, my notes were shorter. This might explain why I am still completing my doctoral studies, but Elizabeth, I promise I'm getting back on track. Uh, I, I also, I just really briefly, I look out in the audience, I look forward to uh, connecting with so many uh, friends and uh, colleagues that I've only sometimes met virtually, but also I uh, haven't seen uh, in some time uh, and want to commend uh, the organizers of today's event for bringing us all together because you can feel the buzz in the room right between breaks and afterwards. And I do look forward to connecting with many of you after this. Uh, I appreciate being uh, given the opportunity to speak. Uh, and I think about the, the, you know, the theme of colleges roles in um, building the Ontario of tomorrow. 
And so I guess the that leads to the question of, well, what is the Ontario of tomorrow that we want to build? Uh, I, and yes, you heard from the deputy, as you've heard from our other speakers, I, I know in the, in the very core of my being, and I've experienced over two decades, the incredible influence that colleges have in responding and shaping our communities and our provinces across this country. So I, I know that colleges are well positioned to, to help achieve whatever that agenda may be, but I, I think it does really beg the question of stepping back. I mean, we are in, I think at a crossroads as a province uh, in terms of, of where we're at now and where we wanna go provincially and, and as a country. Uh, and I think the last few years have, you know, if they've shown us anything, it's that we are, whether we like it or not, in an incredibly globally interdependent world. So I think, you know, the role that colleges have uh, in shaping the Ontario of tomorrow has to be seen with that lens uh, in mind. And at the same time, so, you know, we, and as we call, you know, the, when Bill Davis set up the Ontario College system, it was very local. It was directly, you know, the idea being that colleges would respond to very local needs. And yet, you know, my first comments this morning are we have to think global because ultimately that those are the forces that are shaping our world. So how do we connect with that global lens in mind? How do we connect our core mission of responding locally with, within that global context? And so I, I think that, it's trying to balance those out that in many ways are, are part of the challenge of, of being a college president in, in Ontario today. We also as a province need to wrestle with the fact that we have some, and we're standing in the core of Canada's largest city, we have this incredible urban population, vibrant, amazing cities, in a province that's made up of hundreds and hundreds of communities that are small and getting smaller. And how do we balance that out? And as a provincial government, I'm sure they wrestle with this every day. How do we sustain those communities while recognizing the magnetic draw of some of the large cities that, that are within the province? And colleges, and this is the local part for me the, of, of our role and mission. Colleges have this incredible, incredible impact anywhere that, that we operate, but it's particularly pronounced in communities like Timmins or Hearst or Welland or Fort Erie or wherever it is that colleges have a local presence. Uh, we talked at the Blue Ribbon panel when we met with the Blue Ribbon panel the other day, um, the Committee of Presidents. We talked about this very specifically. Ontario colleges have a presence in close to 200 communities across the province. So this is, I think, again, contextually, one of the, the balance, balances that we have to, to really think, think through. Mm -hmm. Of course, I also think that we are leaders in shaping both the, the, the society that we want to have and in providing pathways to opportunity for our, for our students. And ultimately, you know, I think Ontario needs to, and this is kind of that broader context, the Ontario of tomorrow, I think, has to be uh, ever more globally ready, uh, ready to shape agendas, but also take advantage of opportunities. While at the same time, having sustainable, strong, fair, caring communities across this province with robust economies that will retain young people, that will attract new businesses, and colleges have an enormous role to play in that. So I always think about, I guess, you know, in terms of, of work, those core roles and within that broader context, I always think of colleges as agents of change and of being the ultimate connectors. 
our students, and I say this to you as someone that is a student here at Canada's largest university that has worked at a large research intensive university. And I say this with great respect. Uh, universities have an enormous and important role to play in the future of, of our province and of our country. Uh, but I think it's, it's the, the college's role in working as an equal partner and being seen as an equal partner to prospective students, to employers, to the parents of prospective students, and to universities as well as government, I think is, is going to really be important as if we want to achieve everything that Ontario is capable of in achieving uh, in the future. And I, I often think about, and I sometimes I'm a little cheeky about this, um, I'll talk to prospective students and they'll say, well, so what, you know, what are you interested in? And they'll mention programs that I know colleges and Niagara College have fantastic programming in. And that's, you can see their eyes light up. I want to, I want to be a, you know, I want to, I want to work in broadcasting. I want to be a, a cook. I want to be a chef. I want to be in, I'll pick on some of our fine programs, uh, a brewmaster. Um, I, I really, really uh, want to work with seniors. Um, and I say, oh, that's great. And then I say, where are you going to school? And they'll say, oh, well, university I'm going to, and they'll pick the university. And this is the cheeky part. I said, well, that's great. I said, I'll, we'll see at Niagara College in a few years. And more and more, that is absolutely true. The percentage of our students who already have a university degree or some portion of a university degree is extraordinarily high. And I, I think that that's part of the story that we need to keep telling, because when I talk about an equal partnership between colleges and universities in shaping the Ontario's future, I, I think that's really important to recognize. We also, and it was ready reference, play a fundamental role that's different than universities. I, I think it's different than universities possibly can imagine, uh, you know, even if they wanted to, being able to do, and that is, uh, truly, we, as, as Glenn talked about, we reflect the socioeconomic profile of Ontario. Uh, our students, by and large, are domestic students, but also our international students come from families of lower socioeconomic backgrounds. They also, uh, I often think, they, they also are with, they join us at a point in their life where it's their second chance. They're older. They've had uh, different life pathways and experiences. And when we talk, when, when I talk with them, when we see them, uh, you know, engaged, uh, it's life changing. And that, that a commitment to access and the ability to, in terms of shaping the Ontario of tomorrow, for us to change lives and to give students who otherwise would not have access to post secondary education a chance to, to uh, grow their, their own lives, grow their own opportunities, and by, by giving them uh, that education and training, and I always think about our, our role as in the, you know, I'll say we're in the, in the business of citizen development, by have, giving them that post-secondary experience, also enabling them to be stronger members of their community and to contribute to their employers uh, in the future. So, I think ultimately our, our roles uh, as colleges are as agents of change in the individual lives of our students, uh, but also uh, in connectors and, in, and, and as builders in building the local economies, um, working with local uh, and regional and provincial and national companies to through applied research to where they bring their problems to us and we, we work with them to make them more competitive or work on product development uh, and in building our communities. Uh, more and more part of the building our communities is finding ways of ensuring that, that local companies uh, and local communities become more diverse and we support that growth and diversity and become more globally connected. Uh, and 
in finding ways of serving as a resource to our communities. And I think Maureen talked and gave some brilliant examples of that in terms of working with, with the local council, uh, looking and bringing data to help inform the decisions, but again, being present and, and in finding ways of, of building those connections. So I look forward to uh, taking, a, uh, I, can, I think my time's come to an end. I could certainly keep talking, I won't, uh, but I look forward to taking any questions and engaging in further conversation. Well, thank you very much, Sean. And next we'll ask Beverly to uh, take the mic and you're gonna stay there, right? Yes. Okay. Is it on? Okay, great. Yeah, I think, I think, I think it's, it's working yeah. fine. So um, thank you just for those kind words of introduction this morning. Um, and especially, again, a thank you to all my fellow panel members uh, for your valuable leadership perspectives that you've been sharing with us, all of, uh, all of us this morning. And of course, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Lisa and her organizing team for putting this symposium together. So I'm truly humbled to be part of this distinguished panel of college leaders here today. But uh, before I get started, I just want to take a minute just to expand a little bit more on Chris's kind introduction to me. Um, and for all those graduate and doctoral students out there who are joining us today, this is what I don't mind referring to as my positionality, if you want to call it that, and it's relation to my identity. And these are familiar terms to all of us. And many of us are past or current thesis writers of CCL cohorts, so we're all familiar with that. So I will start by saying that I, that I am an Anishinaabekwe, and part of my identity as an Ojibwe woman is my Ojibwe name and clan. But my English name is Beverly Roy, and I was born and raised on what is termed an Indian reserve on Manitoulin Island in Northern Ontario. And of course, that's defined by the Indian Act of 1876 and all of its subsequent amendments. Of course, I have family members who also attended Indian residential schools, and which I'm hoping most of everyone in this room is now aware of because of all that great deep soul spirit work that Justice Murray St. Clair did with the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission report that was released almost eight years ago now. While my, while my experience uh, personally um, wasn't that I attended a residential school, but I did attend what is known as an Indian day school. Um, the goals were essentially the same. Um, it was just less overt and a little more subtle, um, but the objectives were still the same. Um, my parents, and all of their 10 or so siblings that are in, on each side of my family, they're all fluent Ojibwe speakers, but I am not. And neither are my siblings, my twin brother and sister. So although I'm here with you today um, as, a, as a, a leader in, in higher education, I'm here without my language in the Shnabem went, but I've been on that personal learning journey for a number of years and it's something I expect to do for the foreseeable future. Um, but coincidentally enough, I also happen to be a learner that is able to earn degrees and credentials in the same way that all of us in the room are here. And so at the moment, I'm in full swing of writing my dissertation thesis, and it's about Anishinaabeg education sovereignty for the place that I live, Minom um, Nisting on Manitoulin Island. So that's a little bit about my, my own positionality as I, as I share with you today. But part of it is you're probably wondering why I'm sharing all of this with you. Um, and as I thought about today, I was remembering that not so long ago, in 2017, uh, the community colleges celebrated their 50-year anniversary. But I wasn't sure if people in the room would also knew that 2017 was also an important year for Indigenous institutes too, such as the place that I work at, Ken Fuente. So there are nine of us in Ontario and we are all recognized under provincial legislation known as the Indigenous Institutes Act. But 2017 isn't the year that we as Indigenous Institutes began our work. The legislation that I, refer, that I refer to has only recognized and affirmed the role that we were already doing. So now we have colleges, universities, and we have Indigenous Institutes in Ontario. So the place that I work at, Kanji Gwenteg, we've been doing this work as a community-based organization, providing what has largely been access to higher ed opportunities in Ontario's North for over 30 years now. And we've been doing this uh, with many of our partner colleges and universities, and we will continue doing that in the foreseeable future. But what we do know is that the landscape has started to change 
starting as a result of that act. There's going to be more opportunities for growth and to build that uh, future for Ontario. And I'm sure if you were to look up on Google, uh, all the other eight institutes in Ontario, you would find that most, if not all of us, have been doing this work for decades. So I would like to take this minute to actually acknowledge one of our newest partners, Fleming College. And I say thank you to Maureen here today because our teams have been working for several years together now to bridge and bring health sector careers to Ontario's rural north. And she has shared many of her ideas on how important that is. So thank you, Maureen. So I wanted to kind of go back to this notion about um, you know, who we are as a sector in higher ed. And I, I, I wanna take this opportunity to share that, you know, there's another space and another place for institutes such as the place that I work at, and we're neither a college and we're neither a university, but what we are, are recognized and accredited and quality assured places of learning for indigenous communities. And we welcome indigenous and non-indigenous learners into our spaces. So, for those who may not be familiar with the work that we do as a result of the, le of the legislation in 2017, we are able to create and to develop all credentials along the Ontario Qualifications Framework. So that ranges from micro-credentials to certificates, diplomas, and degrees. And we heard some of our panelists speak about that transition and the new changes that are happening within our sector. So I, I think it's important for me to, to highlight that, you know, that we are, um, officially recognized as part of the third pillar of Ontario's higher education sector. And we look forward to being a part of building that Ontario for tomorrow. Um, I also wanna share that I, don't, I have no problem voicing and saying out loud that indigenous institutes like us, we have been mostly working from the margins, you might say for many decades. So while, you know, while today's theme is about the role of colleges in Ontario's future, I would also like to put it out there, and I certainly would be remiss if I didn't, um, that not only not only do colleges play that, cri that critical role, but we as places uh, grounded in our communities in, in Ontario's north, we provide uh, spaces that, that provide culturally and community grounded learning opportunities for Ontario's future too. So similar to what the colleges are feeling, I, I would have to say, that the role we play in our communities and region is often not talked about in a similar way. We are the anchors that not only support careers and jobs as a necessary part of life, but Indigenous institutes are also the places and place, the spaces and places where the reclamation of culture, identity, and language begins to occur for new generations. And we are often doing double and sometimes triple duty in the work that we do. But I'm not here to, to say how all, because we're all overworked, and I don't think that experience is any different from, from anyone in this room. But I think the message I want to share with you is that we're willing to do this double and triple duty uh, of, of work that's required for us for Ontario's future. Because when, if we're given the chance, we will not only mobilize the fastest growing population in Canada to help address a skills and labor shortage, but together with the colleges, we can advance and grow even faster perhaps what I call something that might be a new inspiring type of critical education consciousness based on Indigenous perspectives. And I think, I really believe in the bottom of my heart that this, ben this will benefit not only higher ed organizations, but Ontario too. Because once that happens, our Indigenous perspectives and ways of, 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 of being and living in the world become weaved into the labor market and economy in a very good way. And at OISE, of course, we know that social justice education is never too far from our thoughts. And so the one thing I also ask you to remember when you're all out in the world doing your wonderful and amazing work um, is something that I hope for in my lifetime would be, some, would be something along the line of creating and having a pedagogy of normalized, decolonized activism. And part of this would be raising the consciousness in your teaching and learning or in any job or role that you are part of, so that Indigenous peoples can continue to be a part of figuring out the complex and compounded colonial experiences that we continue to face in the year 2023. So colleges, Indigenous institutes, and universities all have a tremendous role to play in that, in that future together. As we all know, you know, we are in a climate of fiscal challenges uh, ahead of us. Um, 
but I know we are not we are on a good very we are on a very good path forward. So I know that with so many great thinkers in this room, it will be our lifelong work to help others connect the dots when maybe they just can't see it yet. And to collectively collaborate on the value and worldview of, ind of Indigenous education in Ontario. Because I really believe that when we all raise up and believe that we can all be part of the new consciousness, which by the way can happen with good allyship in the, in the college community sector and with us as Indigenous institutes any, at any time, it will always be a win-win uh, and future, um, future wins for everyone in Ontario. So like my esteemed panel members have shared, um, we participate in the processes that Ontario is talking about. And you know we've been invited to be part of blue ribbon, blue ribbon panels and all of the things that my esteemed panelists have equally shared, shared with you. But my future is also practical and pragmatic because I know the work is going to be hard, but together with, with the visions that colleges have, um, we can create new allyship, we can create wonderful partnerships that disrupt uh, the thinking for future generations, and we can build this new consciousness together. So with that, I look forward to that work ahead. Um, I look forward to engaging with all of the partners um, that we work with and, and many new ones ahead. So uh, with that, I guess we'll just um, leave that for, for future thoughts. And um, I guess we'll see what happens next. Thank you, miigwech. Thank you very much, Beverly. Now I'd uh, ask Corey to come on up and after Corey, we'll be in the uh, Q&A uh, session. Corey. So for all the people who are baseball fanatics, I guess I'm the closer, the ninth inning closer. And I'm left-handed too, so it's a, it's a good thing. So uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak. Thank you, University of Toronto OISE and the organizers of the symposium, um, because I think the topic is very, very um, important, and that's the role of, co role of colleges in building Ontario's future. I want to start off with um, something a little bit different. Um, I'm going to have a personal story to show you the power of college. It was back 20 years ago, 20, 2004, when I was hired by the University Health Network in Mount Sinai Hospital to do two things, build a wellness strategy and build a learning strategy for the downtown hospitals. Um, it's an interesting thing because the ultimate goal was they wanted to build a learning community amongst their employees and, and, and staff. Um, I started in and within about a, the first week, the head of human resources came to me and said, can I see you in my office? I said, sure. She said, you've been tasked and commissioned to do two things, a wellness strategy and a learning strategy. The learning strategy is gonna be very easy to do. The wellness strategy will be really hard. I said, well, how did you determine that? And she said, well, I'm gonna give you a st statistic that, is, that will tell you why your learning strategy is going to be very um, easy to accomplish. Did you know that 65% of our employees in the downtown core hospitals are either college trained, college credentialed, or have been to college in their employment. So I didn't know that. And if you think about it, that's the real power of colleges is we always talk about the other side of, um, and that is the doctor side, that they're university trained, but everybody else, pretty much everybody else, 65% of that population got their credentials at a college. So, um, and you can translate that to other industries as well. So that's the importance of what we actually do. Uh, needless to say, the wellness strategy was tough to do because uh, we had to fight the, um, the paradigm of uh, Western medicine. So that was really, really tough. The actual learning strategy was very easy and they became learning communities. And one thing she said to me, which was very interesting is she said that college students, it's in their DNA to learn. They're lifelong learners. They have to learn because everything is changing all the time for them. And so that's kind of a, a moniker for what happens at our colleges. It's changing all the time and we have to keep up with the changes. So foundationally, if you look at the history of colleges, it really was 
since their inception, colleges sort of acted as a, as a broker between industry and students. Today, it's a little bit different. Today, we've injected entrepreneurial spirit and the ability to actually go out and do things on your own and be innovative and discover different things. And I owe that a lot to the, the new regiment of uh, curricula and faculty that are, are training our students. Because ultimately, that's a post-secondary educational uh, opportunity that is not seen elsewhere. So simply put, um, it used to be that we played a vital role in the employment supply and demand equation. Um, I'm not so sure that's exactly what happens today. I think it's a lot more complex. And our role as a broker uh, requires our constant screening and scanning of what's out there, what's in the real world. And whoever ever came up with the initial idea of program advisory committees, the PACs, it was a brilliant idea because those are the people that inform our professors and our curriculum as to what are the newfangled things that are happening in their industry so gives us the, the head start into anticipating the future. Because we actually said that in the future role of colleges, but I actually believe the future is now. We have to do things today to preserve that future to be healthy. And so what happens is at colleges, everybody knows this, we adapt very, very quickly. We change on the fly. We institute different kinds of things. Case in point, uh, a concept came through the medical curriculum of interprofessional education where students learn from, with, and about one another. Well, at, at one certain time, you sort of say to yourself, well, that's pretty cool, uh, but it's not gonna happen. We teach in silos. Uh, and then you look at authentic cases of interprofessional education. It seems when you visit your dentist, the dental hygienist, the dental assistant, the dentist, uh, the, the receptionist, they all kind of work in unison together to make sure that your experience is a very, very positive one. And so if you take that model and move it into education, there's so many different ways to gain access and gain a new way of doing things through interprofessional education, putting the student at the center, just like in medicine, putting the client or the patient at the center and everybody around is actually helpful in the student's um, uh, development. When it was asked about uh, this uh, symposium, um, there was um, a, a title on opportunities and challenges, and I, I don't want to sort of go through all the other things that were talked about because I think after Dr. Jones' speech, after uh, Deputy Minner's speech, and my esteemed colleagues, that uh, they've hit on a number of different kinds of um, opportunities and challenges. But um, I'm going to talk about a little, a few opportunities that are out there that I think are really ripe for the taking. I think the first one is the power of 24 colleges. We seem to still be a bit siloed in what we're trying to do. So could you imagine the day when an applied research project gains the expertise and takes the expertise from individual colleges and builds a grant application? I think that would be a wonderful idea. And I think um, that would also start to be getting other kinds of grants. So through applied research, I think we can do that. Um, we have to set aside the competitiveness away and actually gain unity in what we're trying to do. The other is obviously a, being a central hub for skilling, reskilling, upskilling, whatever you want to blank skill um, to talk about where we have already great practice in second career funding as to how to do this. And we also have very vibrant previous learning uh, areas, uh, PLRs, that actually can actually hit the road running. So for example, in concert with the immigration strategy and bringing new immigrants to Canada who already have credentials, who already have training, we're able to hit the road running. So could you imagine for internationally trained nurses, educated nurses, because there is a shortage, can you imagine if we were able to do the PLR with those nurses and put them through an intensive 10 week training course to Canadianize their experience uh, through internationally acclaimed simulation labs and, and wards, we could be able to, there's probably 100,000 internationally trained nurses out there that we could actually bring to marketplace. Um, we need that as uh, an opportunity for the colleges to do. And I believe that's in many, many other skilled trades. Well, uh, a couple other ones are is basically this um, idea of sustainability and the sustainability movement. Um, I think colleges can play a vital role at George Brown College. We're one of the first uh, colleges to build a mass timber, net zero carbon uh, uh, wood building that's going to serve as a living lab 
for our students in the construction and mechanical engineering and the architectural technology area. And that actual building, <clears throat> pardon me, will, the learnings of that building will be translated back into curriculum. So the next generation of graduates will already be trained in smart buildings. And that's how nimble and resilient the college system is. That things that we're doing on the ground, things that we incubate and conceive, we can directly implant back into curriculum. Very important. Another one is we can actually um, be seen as models for fostering the diversity and inclusion piece and the indigenization piece so that industry can actually learn from us as to how to do this because we're all at some different levels and stages of, of doing it properly. Some of the challenges that were talked about, it's the same challenges that happen with every industry. There's always funding challenges. There's always logistical. Um, but I think the college is, is strategic enough and uh, innovative enough to get around some of these challenges. Uh, we've been doing it for years. Um, and so um, it, it can happen quite easily. There's also uh, another thing where it's, it's time to actually remove some of the barriers and the friction against continuous learning so that there'd be seamless pathways to somewhere else. Or can you imagine a day where students could actually broker their own education, they can actually build their own credential, they can pick from a smorgasbord of, of pieces and actually build what they need. That would be pretty cool. And so that's why I say that the, the, um, the, the, the future is now and that keeping the student first, keeping front and center, we'll be able to do a lot of things uh, if we relate back to that, that's our grounding force. So as colleges are evolving and education is evolving, industry is evolving all at the same time. But the education piece remains a constant imperative for the well-being and, and advancement of society. So after all, knowledge is the most powerful determinant of health, justice, and prosperity that provides longer-term dividends to individuals and security. It was once said to me that it was interesting, if you were to build a city from scratch the, and you wanted it to be a community-lived city, what would be the first thing that you build? And the first thing that came to mind was a community college. Uh, and you can actually see why, because it actually insinuates itself, the tentacles of a community college insinuate itself to every walk of life. And so advancing the philosophy of lifelong learning uh, will enable colleges to meet the needs of our city and province. And remember the moniker that respect the past, uh, embrace the future, because quite frankly, uh, I'm the old Sir Isaac Newton quote, if I've seen further than others, because I stood on the shoulders of giants, there have been giants right from 1967 forward, and um, we learn all the day from them. And I actually do believe that we're in very, very good hands uh, with a very, very vibrant uh, college system. And I just want to leave you with one note. I had a conversation with faculty once about, um, about change. And the faculty member said to me that, oh, you know, Corey, change is tough. It's very hard. It's, uh, you know, I, people don't do well with change. I said, I acknowledge that. I, I think it's true, but, you know, together, we'll change together and we'll, we'll do some amazing things. Because remember that if you don't like change, you're really not going to like obsolescence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Corey. And uh, I want to thank all of our panelists for those insightful and thought provoking remarks. Thank you very much. And I'm also quite amazed uh, that for a panel like this, they all actually kept within the timelines that assigned them. So congratulations on that one as well. So hopefully that will reflect in the marks I get as the moderator today. Thanks, Glenn. So um, I'm just going to, and you're probably thinking of some questions. I'm going to turn it over, and I have lots of questions that I can answer, but I do. we do want to uh, go to the floor, and I think we're going to have the mics for people that want questions. But I just want to maybe summarize some of the things that I heard, so maybe that will uh, spark some thoughts that you might have. So uh, Maureen started us off and, and did a great job of covering off three key points. Really, uh, the colleges as conveners for that disruptive discussion, and she gave examples of that. She also talked about the role of colleges in city building, and that means different things to different communities. And then she also talked about our capacity and our uh, potential to uh, influence uh, government, the sort of the go-to institutions to, to influence government. Um, then we heard from Sean, who sort of uh, took the theme of the panel and turned it around and said, what is the Ontario of tomorrow that we want to build? 
and he, he began uh, by approaching uh, the, the, uh, his remarks that way. And then he reminded us about finding that constant balance that we're always working towards about uh, uh, acting and thinking locally uh, as well as globally, thinking about the differences about how, to, how we have to balance the needs of urban uh, versus rural. Colleges of agents of change, we heard that from a number of our presenters, and, and colleges as connectors, as conveners to connect different players. Then we went on to hear from Beverly, who uh, talked about her positionality, but also reminded us that uh, the uh, Indigenous Institutes have been working for decades, although there's been changes in, in their formal status. They're neither college nor university. And, uh, and I know this firsthand, having worked with uh, various institutes down in Eastern Ontario, that they do remarkable things in terms of being innovative. Uh, one is just to survive because of the poor funding environments they've had in the past. But they're neither colleges nor universities, but really need to be considered as the third pillar of our higher education system, uh, which they are considered as now. And then uh, Beverly also ended by saying um, she would like to see someday, and I wrote this down for further thought for myself, is a develop a pedagogy of normalized, decolonized uh, activism. And hopefully I got that almost right. So something for us to think about. And then uh, Corey, as our closer, um, uh, started off with a uh, personal story of how he was hired to develop a learning and a wellness strategy. He reminded us that uh, that change and being lifelong learners is in the DNA of our students, our grads, but also as institutions to be current with all the changes uh, out there. And uh, he touched on the power of 24, uh, as well as colleges as a skilling hub, whether that's upskilling, reskilling, and that really is, I think, a differentiator that we still have out there in, in the marketplace. Um, and then the college's role in terms of other big issues of the day, such as sustainability uh, and inclusion. So that's a little summary of my perspective, just to uh, uh, for food for thought for everyone. And at this point, um, I'm going to see if anybody wants to ask the first question. So we have a couple of hands up, one at the back and just one at the front. So are you going to run the mic? So let's go back first. Thank you. And you can ask your question of a specific panel member or we'll lob it out and see who wants to catch it. Hi, it's Lisa Willihan here. Thank you um, to the entire panel for an excellent set of um, presentations. So I was really taken with Maureen's notion of um, colleges as city builders and Sean's notion of um, the global and the local, connecting and local but also Beverly's notion of place-based institutions and Corey's about how um, colleges need to respond locally. My, 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 my assertion is that colleges in Canada, but also in the other systems I'm familiar with, have always been defined uh, residually, that is, as doing what um, universities and schools don't do. Um, and I think our challenge is to articulate a role for colleges that um, colleges can do better than um, universities and schools or do differently or do or what they can do that universities and schools can't do. So my question to the panel is what do colleges do that universities can't do um, and uh, how should we define them in distinction to um, universities, not as residual but as doing a, with the positive social role? Okay, thank you, Lisa. So uh, I think our panelists uh, heard that question. So what can the colleges do that the universities don't do? And we touched a little bit about the uh, the differences and uh, uh, between roles. So I, I see Sean is bravely, or he's been handed the mic. <laughs> good, good one, Maureen. Sean. Well, uh, it's a I mean, I think it's a really, really critical question. There's a number of things that come to mind. I just want to mention two, and and I, you know, I, again, I think it's I say it respectfully. I think universities have this incredible role in building uh, our societies and building new knowledge. Uh, colleges are where the rubber hits the road, uh, and we're able to be more responsive to em emerging immediate needs uh, in terms of workforce or social needs. And I think that's that's the that responsiveness, that ability to really move quickly. And we saw examples of that during uh, the pandemic, when when there was an immediate uh, you know call to to train more personal support workers. 
or practical nurses. Uh, and, and colleges, we, you know, we, we opened up and created new seats within a matter of weeks, weeks. Uh, and, and that, you know, that ability to respond is critical. Uh, and the, the other is, I think, exemplified in our applied research. And that is something that has evolved in a way that 10 or 15 years ago was just emerging. Now it's, it's a full part of many colleges work. And it's a, it really turns that research, you know, equation or that traditional research paradigm on its head. Uh, and both are, are, are incredibly valuable. Uh, research or researcher driven new knowledge, which is the university model is very important. But the ability for colleges to respond to local companies, to SMEs in particular, uh, where they come to us and they say, we want to be more competitive. We're in this incredibly uh, com you know, global, globally competitive marketplace, but we don't have the ability to do our own research and development. Can you help us with that? Uh, that is going to be critical to building Ontario's uh, future. And uh, I was recently in Ireland, and I think the Irish have figured this out very well. Their Irish, what was the Irish Institutes of Technology, and now the Irish Technological Universities. I think that model and finding, and I don't think the deputy is still here, uh, but, but f finding ways to support the college's ability to, to, to do more in, in supporting SMEs, in advancing competitiveness, advancing product development, uh, I think will also be, be critical. Thanks, Sean. Maureen? I'll just add on point, not to repeat. This is our moment in time with the Blue Ribbon panel. We have Mary Lynn sitting here. Um, we should all be tackling her on the way out. But <laughs> this is our moment in time. And what was very telling at the meeting we had this week was when Bonnie Patterson asked us all, Tell us about your efficiency story. And instead of us being able to tell the story, everybody turtled worrying that if we tell them we're so efficient, they might just continue to give us less and less. But I would urge us that this is our moment in time to tell the story that, that uh, Sean has so articulately begun. Thanks, Maureen. Anyone else want to tackle that one? So thank you for the question, uh, Lisa. And uh, I, I think, you know, the point that we've taken from this is that, you know, Sean said, working closer with SMEs. As we know, we're involved in that entire ecosystem. It's about learner, it's about community, but our ability to develop those deep relationships uh, with employers of all types over the years, that's been in our DNA. Uh, work integrated learning, experiential learning. We know that the colleges have been in that game a lot longer than any other institutional type in Ontario, although the others are getting there. So one of the things I always think about is competitive pressures out there is, is everybody now wants to do what is in our DNA. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's almost a question there, but I won't throw that one out later. We can revisit that one. So, so thank you. So let's uh, go, I think, Phil, you had a question, right? You want the mic right here, or just in the middle, middle of the row? Hi, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for all that you said today. And hi, Beverly, from my cohort. It's nice to see you there. <laughs> uh, Maureen, you spoke about uh, colleges being conveners of disruptive discussion and influencing government policy. And what I'm asking is, how does that actually manifest itself? Who is it in the college system that sits at the table and is able to engage in those discussions? And how does that come about? So from my perspective, this is where a college president plays that very role that we were intended to play as a community leader. And it's convening all of those leaders. We all have great networks and influence, and it's bringing that influence to a safe place where everyone gets to talk about it. I can tell you at this Ignite successful symposium, there was nothing about it to do with Fleming College. We just did the work to make it happen. Yeah, we stuck our logo here and there, but it... It was people thought it was about all of them and all of their ideas. And I think that's where colleges need to play a role that is a little uh, less biased, but I think it's our civic duty. Go ahead, Sean. I'm just going to add an example because it's, you know, we talked earlier the, the, around the incredible growth of international students uh, in Canada and across the Ontario college system. 
but of course that puts pressures um, on local and smaller communities uh, or smaller cities or larger cities. Uh, and just to pick up on that, I, I think of another example where uh, Sheridan College uh, and the president of Sheridan College, but Sheridan College convened in Brampton um, a two-day uh, symposium that brought together community agencies, local government, local employers, uh, educational providers to really, really dig into uh, what is the nuanced, incredibly complex, nuanced set of, of very real challenges that we've all seen in the news in, in various ways over the past uh, couple of years. But I think, again, it was an example of the role that colleges can play in convening that conversation. Mm -hmm. Beverly? Hi, I just couldn't resist answering uh, Phil's question because that is ultimately the challenge that we as, as part of the sector face in our daily work. Um, you know, we are passionate about the work that we do on the ground in, in operations, but definitely as, as Maureen has shared, the work of community leaders is to advance the policy goals and advance the, the, the role that we can play in education for a brighter and future Ontario. So, I mean, that's the million dollar question that a lot of us, um, especially in our sector as Indigenous institutes that we, that we wrestle with and grapple with on a daily basis. So we, we're, we're always pulled in different directions, but I think at the end of the day is we remain committed and attuned to the work that needs to happen. And the more we talk about these things and participate in these uh, engaging disruptive discussions, I think more of it will start to happen and we can influence uh, government policy as we all need to. Um, one of the things I did was I flagged down the deputy minister as she was leaving the ramp because one of the things I wanted to do was make sure that I can get a meeting with her and that's that's what um, being part of a community um, network and leadership is all about. We need to have those tough conversations and we need to help people connect the dots when they don't see things um, from, the from the perspectives that we see them. Um, happening in our communities and, and on a day-to-day -day basis affecting the lives of students. So, I mean, just as a, a sidebar, you know, when a, we're focused here in Ontario, and that's the focus of today, but for Indigenous institutes, as an example, we also are calling to task the federal government and all of these discussions. Um, so that's the work that we're currently engaged in as well. And like Maureen has said, you know, um, being efficient and working on a dime is not something we want to say we're really good at because we could do so much more if we were given um, adequate investment as well. So, I mean, it's a, it's a two-pronged conversation. We want to certainly demonstrate proficiency and efficiencies, um, but at the same time, always demonstrate the potential for growth and opportunity um, that can happen uh, as well. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Beverly. Okay. Um... Okay, I, I think there's a question behind the pillar. <laughs> yeah, I'm behind here. For me. Um, I'd just like to turn the conversation on its head slightly. And uh, I really thank you for, for your presentations. I think it is wonderful to explore this idea of community. And uh, But I wanted to ask the question is, is the community just here? Because it seems to me that we have a unique uh, opportunity with our international students to actually do some broader outreach, uh, contribute to the UN sustainability goals, but also to think in terms of our students as ambassadors for the college system the other way as well. So internationalization goes two ways. And what I was thinking of is local businesses, how many local businesses are there in the many, many communities around Ontario that would like to have some sort of international connection or a uh, uh, or opportunity to uh, uh, expand their business into emerging markets. Uh, India, 1.4 billion people and counting. Um, many of our students come from India. Could they do work integrated learning in their home country, acting as local arrangements coordinators, and the colleges then act as an incubator hub with the businesses in your communities and facilitating that exchange? I just seem to me, it seems that we've got a lot of opportunity that we haven't tapped into. Thank you. So I can answer this from uh, a George Brown perspective, is that uh, we consider community 
the world community. And so there's not only uh, our students, the community members and the industry, our local industry, but everybody, especially with international. That's one of the reasons why about four or five years ago, we introduced cultural competencies uh, into the curriculum so that we could start the beginnings of internationalization, understanding internationalization at our home base. But we've now reached through a number of uh, specialized charrettes and um, focus groups to actually say, mm, maybe we should be actually more of a global outreach and maybe our professors should be out in their home country uh, teaching before they get the Canadian experience because there's nothing worse than seeing 60 students from Delhi in a classroom, not really, they could have been in Delhi without the added expense of coming to Canada. So um, I think that's a delicate balance when it comes to international, but I do see in everywhere that I travel internationally, there are pockets or, or some kind of pop-ups of whether it's university or colleges that are trying to now move outwards into global engagement as opposed to just a recruitment tool. I could talk for a long time on this topic, <laughs> so I'll keep it short. Uh, I guess there's enormous opportunity, and in fact, it's a missed opportunity to not think about the global reach of Ontario colleges, uh, both, and I'll put it in a little more local context, uh, you know, Niagara College has, we have 5,000 international students from 100 countries. Uh, in the Niagara region and small communities, we have transformed the region. Our ability to work with employers, to, to have that talent, that global talent connected to our employers as they think, and, and our industry as they think about how they, they compete with the world, I think is really, really critical. We did have an example uh, I can, that comes to mind right away recently, you know, uh, not, not so long ago, where we had students who worked with a local winery on just a, it was a business project, uh, and they wrote up a business plan of, of how this winery could, could export wines uh, in Asia. And uh, the winery owner liked it so much as, well, do you think you could actually make this happen? The students then took that, worked with them, and actually got it going. Uh, it now uh, it doubled his uh, business. He, I think he said uh, uh, most recently uh, $4 million a year. I mean, he's a small local winery now uh, able to, to figure out how to, to reach that market. That's just one example. If you multiply that out uh, hundreds of times, thousands of times, that ability of, of our international mm -hmm. students to connect Ontario and Ontario businesses and Ontario communities to the world uh, is sig a significant opportunity. And the flip is the Ontario college system is a model for the world. The, the TVET, you know, the, technical vocational education and training that the demand for that globally is significant and there is great opportunity. Niagara College is one of a number of colleges in the country uh, and and uh, Corey talked about this, that is delivering programming overseas uh, in local communities working uh, uh, through branch campuses or other training delivery sites, in fact, to help meet those local needs by bringing Ontario uh, college know-how in delivering that education and training in local communities uh, across the globe. And I think there's great opportunities to do even more of that. Thanks, Sean and Corey. Okay, I see uh, some more hands. So one there, and there's another gentleman at the front as well. Hi, everybody. Uh, Tim Cricker here from Conestoga College. Thanks so much for your comments today. I don't know if I have a question or more of just an observation. <laughs> I'm just curious to get some of your thoughts. I. Uh, Lisa, I loved your question about, you know, the, the, what do we as colleges do differently or uniquely from universities? And I, I just think it's a great thing to ponder as we think about building uh, the, the college's role uh, into the future. I think about universities building knowledge. I think about colleges building community. Um, and maybe that's too simplistic, but I, I think that's intriguing and interesting. Um, and then I think about the tension between the way that maybe colleges are still perceived in our community as a second choice to universities, or um, even the way that our branding is dropping the word, well, we've already dropped community from community college, but we're often dropping college from our names. 
So I, I don't know what to do with that. I don't know if there's something more we should think about in the future, but I just wanted to offer that observation as one singular observation, and I'm not sure if that's consistent with others, but I'm just curious as presidents what your, what your take is on it. Thank you. Thank you. So really good question that I know we all think about in different ways. And there was a, a, a phrase coined a number of years ago that we used in talking about relationships with universities and other institutions, the parity of esteem. So, so how are we doing on the parity of esteem and sort of what's happening? I've been away for a while. <laughs> uh, it's a great question. You know, for me, when I took the role of president some five years ago, I took it on the condition that I wasn't going to have to try to make Fleming a university and that we should be proud of what we do. We have a, we have a mandate that I was, that mandate is still pretty timeless. It is for a different type of population that is critical to our economy. So I, you know, I think we should wear it proudly and and not worry too much about the university sector. They've got their own problems. <laughs> yeah, I, I referenced this uh, earlier when I was speaking. I mean, I think what in terms of our role in shaping and maximizing and leveraging the college system, it, we do need to tackle this this perception still that that uh, parity of esteem uh, challenge, uh, it's getting better. Uh, the graduate, the growth of graduate certificate programs across the Ontario college uh, sector has vastly changed the conversation from a second choice or for prospective students and their parents, often it's their parents and their high school counselors and their teachers, their influencers, uh, where I think a couple of decades ago, it was, you know, if you're if you're a good academic student, you go to university, and if you're not, well, there's the colleges. Well, that come, it's gotten better, but it's not all the way where we need it to be. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I talked, and this is kind of that cheeky comment to uh, often to, to high school students that are choosing university, and I say, I'll see you in a few years. Uh, that's absolutely <laughs> true. And I think we have to keep telling that story, and it's no longer a second choice. It's an equal choice, but also more and more. It's a it's a it's a choice that where students it's not an either or at all it's a it's a yes and uh, yes going to university and college or going to college and going to, then to university uh, it really goes both ways but I think we have to keep somehow telling that story so it's seen as an equal partnership uh, and I I would agree with Maureen I, I think we uh, I also have you know said for a long time I know that Niagara College is very comfortable in the space that, that we're in. We don't need to have uh, more degrees. We don't need, I mean, th that's the choice that we're making and I'm, you know, I'm not uh, you know, commenting on, on other choices, but for us, we, we know who we are. We know what we're good at and we wanna continue to, to play that role. So I do think colleges have to wrestle with that. I think universities do as well. So what I, the, the, I heard a comment a little while ago, which really stuck with me, which is, um, universities now all want to look more like colleges want to be more applied and colleges want to want to be more like universities well at some point we need to find that balance I think pick our lane realize that we're, we're traveling alongside one another uh, to help build Ontario's future uh, thank you very much for the question uh, but um, it, it um, I kind of resonate with what you're thinking because of the college system um, there's great confusion amongst public as to what the college represents. So for example, um, Ryerson was very, very quick to drop the polytechnic out of its nomenclature. We're pretty quick to adopt that nomenclature through Polytechnics Canada and, and now it's now Seneca Polytechnic. And so the average person out there couldn't tell you what a polytechnic is. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second is, when you do career fairs and the parents come with the students, they're blown away because they don't even know that we confer degrees. And degrees have been around for 12, 14 years, uh, 2001. <laughs> so so um, I, I think you're right. We have to do a better job of really the promotion and what college is all about and what it can be. Uh, and it's, and I, you know, I, I actually don't look at it as the alternative to university is a choice. You make a choice. And um, uh, I have a daughter who's a product of two, a diploma and an advanced diploma from a college who um, did through a professional portfolio and is able to do a master's degree at the University of Glasgow in digital media marketing. 
um, they respected the college education very much because she didn't have a bachelor's degree. You can't really do that here. So um, there's, there's, there's lots of confusion. Beverly? Maybe I'm getting the final <laughs> word here, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, I, I think for me, I, I, I really take to heart all of the comments from my esteemed colleagues here. And I, I, I add this as a first or perhaps a disrupting thought. And I, I think part of it is that, you know, we as institutes are, are nimble and flexible and we can do all the things that colleges do as well. And that's a sort of necessity and, and it's part of our, our operational requirements. But I think the other opportunity that, that allows us for, allows a, a future, a different future, is that we can build uh, new credentials, new, new um, how would I say it? It would be new ways of, of preparing uh, Ontario's future if we work together. So Indigenous institutes, colleges, and universities as one cohesive sector, I think that in itself presents a, a very unique opportunity for Ontario's future. And the fact that um, there are nine of us in Ontario and the fact that we are on that uh, OQ OQF already, I think that in itself presents an untapped idea yet and an untapped uh, partnership relationship that can happen across the sector. So we have this opportunity before us, um, but it's just a matter of timing and when we're able to take on those new ideas and to advance advance our province uh, to even greater heights. So I'm just going to end there. So thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Beverly. So I think we have time for one more. I think we have one more question. So go ahead, please. Just at the front here. We'll get the mic this time. Okay. Oh, the mic. Sure. Uh, Dr. Ross, I just want to say um, your concept about Power of 24 is absolutely brilliant. And I think that's spot on. Um, so my comment really is to, or my question is to the panel. Um, I think it's fair to say that in this day and age, psychological safety is a huge prominent issue that's going on within all industries and all sectors. What can the community colleges do to try to bring more awareness, uh, more intervention for well-intentioned poor decisions that actually lead to poor psychological safety that create these kind of behavioral health issues that go on within organizations and sectors? Thank you. All right, who wants to take that one? So thank you for, for your comments. Um, I think, you know, there's an underlying principle that's used that whenever change happens or decisions are made, you have to seek to understand, to actually see what, it's almost like you have to play out in your mind the different scenarios, because with every, you know, Newton's law, for every action there's a reaction, it's usually not equal and opposite, uh, but, uh, uh, but that you have to play out the scenarios and you also have to mitigate with some strategies those scenarios if it goes awry. So um, I, I know that most often it's with good intentions that decisions are made, but um, you can't predict uh, what the perception will be or the actual physical piece will be. So I think we have to be very conscious. I also think we need actually uh, help and support and also professional advice when making some of these decisions. Um, I don't think all the collective mind at the senior team table is the only table that should be uh, uh, advising on it. So it's, it's a tough question. I would just add that I think colleges are well placed in this in this area as well as you know, every other through our program advisory committees to hear from the industry professionals, the healthcare professionals, the first responders uh, around the challenges and, and, and how programs can evolve to better prepare students uh, to work in those various in those very challenging fields. I would just say I'm completely unqualified to answer that, but I do think we can learn from looking to the healthcare system because that is a system. The college sector is only a sector. We don't do shared services. We don't have centers of excellence. In my view, we're a sector, but I think we can learn a lot from healthcare. And you should learn a lot from Joanne Spicer, who is going to talk about this very topic later today. So that's your whole thesis, I think. Yeah. Mm, great. There you go. Okay. Oh, 
looks like I get the last word. Sure, again. you get the last word again. Yeah. Second last story. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I take a little bit of a different outlook on that on that question. And I think for us, when I mentioned about the double and triple duty that we do with our within our places of learning, is that um, it's really about holistic student development. So this is really about student services having a robust, integrated um, college, or in this case, college and, and indigenous institute. Um, you know, where, where student development is at the core of developing um, citizenship and, and stress management and all of those things about coping in the world. I think, I think that's a, a conversation that maybe needs to be elevated during these times now. Um, it's something that we as Indigenous Institutes have always believed in. We've always believed in holistic development of students. Uh, so that kind of comes some second nature to our thinking. But I think uh, the COVID experience has obviously brought on um, a new dimension and brought this whole area to light. Um, but I think at the end of the day, um, I think once we integrate and we're able to do that as um, as as places and spaces in in, in Ontario, I, I think our students and our graduates and our and our labor force will be able to 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 weather those types of things that that you've described there from from your question. So thank you. Thanks, Beverly. All right, well, I am cognizant of the time and we are at the end. So I know Glenn's there. I think Glenn's gonna come up and make a couple of remarks as we move into lunch, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to uh, once again, thank you all for your participation and your questions and your engagement. And I also wanna thank uh, my distinguished colleagues on the panel for uh, making my job easier and for sharing their uh, wisdom and their knowledge and their experiences today. So <laughs> The applause are for them, please, please. Thank you all. Over to you, Glenn. Well, thanks, thanks to the panel. This has been absolutely wonderful. Everybody kept on time. You know how seldom that is with leaders talking? Um, maybe I'm talking about the university sector and not the college sector. Maybe that's the distinction. So thank you very much for the panel. This has been outstanding. We're heading into our lunch break, and then you'll see uh, box lunches that you can pick up. Uh, please feel free to adjust yourself and sit in groups and, and find a, a nice uh, opportunity to meet with some new colleagues. Um, we are going to ask you at 1245 to please move to the second floor for those sessions, and we're going to start them promptly at 1250. As you know, for, for people who've been practicing and making sure that their presentation is going well, there's nothing worse than having 15 people come in after you've got started. So please try and start at 1250 for those sessions. Um, there is a mistake in the program at three o'clock. It suggests that the vice presidential panel is up on the second floor. It's actually here. Um, so just recognize that after those two uh, sessions go through, uh, come back here at three o'clock for the vice president session. And then the, the uh, reception at the end of the day is up on the 12th floor at our Nexus Lounge. So thank you so much for participating. Thanks to the panel. Enjoy your lunch and we'll see you this afternoon.